Welcome everyone to the final lecture of our series on the Renaissance principle in universal history. Um, for those who have been able to follow, whether the recordings or whether uh, live week to week, what we've tried to do in, this, in the course of this, this lecture cycle has been to uh, take opportunities to investigate different case studies of the Renaissance principle being expressed in various cultures, in various time frames, and really just to get a sense that even though there's a uniqueness and a, differ a differentiation amongst all peoples, all religions, all cultures, there is still something uniquely human, which is fundamental to our mandate to exist, to thrive, to survive within the universe that we are a part of, that we are uniquely capable of making creative eurekas, leaps into the unknown, into the, into the, the domain of universal principles, and translate those back into um, society at large that we're part of by um, scientific and technological progress, things that allow us to translate an immaterial idea, which has no material form, but then to find a way to wrap it metaphorically in language, to express it to other minds, and to test it out to the point that you can discover, well, what sets of ideas are true, and which sets of ideas do you throw away that actually you thought were true and are false, and you have to go back to the drawing board and rehypothesize and go back to work to, to figure out what is the right solution concept to a problem. Um, this has expressed itself in various ways. It's a, it's a very beautiful thing when it happens. And the more we come to explore that component of human civilization, um, the more we discover more about ourselves, which is universal, the more we discover what is that the oligarchy, which has expressed itself in its own dark age tendencies in, in different cultures and civilizations around the world. Uh, what, is, what is this oligarchical uh, system afraid of? What, what is it that, that weakens it um, such that, it, that so much effort is put into subverting truthful sets of ideas and the ability to act upon them politically for the, for the effect that we, we know of as being increased emancipation of, of society, increased degrees of freedom. So, to end this lecture cycle, um, what, what better way than to explore the mind of Dante Alighieri, a, a figure too few people have, have really come to have a chance to, to dive into, um, who did much more than just write some poetry and write a, write a Commedia. And even what he did in that, in that place in the Commedia is, is very, very uh, misunderstood in our present cynical age. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to just say a couple of words of introduction to David Gosselin, who is a, a longtime friend for many years. He is a classical poet in his own right who founded and is editor-in-chief of a, a poetry philosophy website called thechainedmuse.com, which uh, people can write down and, and check out, uh, which is devoted to a 21st century classical poetry. Uh, and the, the thesis that David has maintained in the course of his own writings, in the course of the work he's done to revive um, a certain lost method of poetic composition has been the, the thesis that um, classical poetry is not locked into a certain time in the past, but it is something which touches upon a quality of, of, of mind, which has equal validity today as it did in the 18th century, as it did 2000 years ago, as it will 2000 years in the future. And even though, again, just like I talked about different civilizations expressing their Renaissance principle in different ways, whether China, the Muslim cultural matrix, whether uh, the Christian or the Jewish uh, cultural matrix, there's something still qualitative about what the mind is doing and that, that will come through if you're looking for it. Um, so this is something which you'll, you'll, you'll find the more you explore the chain news. Um, the Rising Tide Foundation has had the privilege of publishing some of Dave's work recent, recently to very good effect. Um, I think with, yeah, I think that that by itself should just set the groundwork a little bit for Dave, who you are now free to take the stage. I'm giving you hosting authorization so you can yes. do screen share and invite people in. Right, and I'll set, a, I'll open my PowerPoint now. So let's see. Uh, Hold on, wait, don't do that yet. Don't do that yet. Hold on. Now you are the, officially the host. Okay, so you could do your uh, screen share. Okay. So let's do that. 
Start the slideshow. So you guys are just seeing, um, you guys can see it now? Yep. Okay. So, hello everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present something on Dante, uh, no small figure in history. Um, so I was thinking about how to present the question of Dante, and so much has been said and written on somebody like Dante. It's, it's quite, there's just so much out there. And uh, so we obviously want to say something. I was thinking about, well, what's the best way to approach it then? There is so much that could be just said about the comedy, about his poetry, about composition about language and I thought it would help to consider the case of Dante from the standpoint of where we are today right in history today because first and foremost Dante as a poet was a leader and so the question of leadership I think is key the question of uh, mission orientation and understanding uh, what drives somebody like a Dante uh, to intervene into history and to understand the historical moment that we're in, I think that's that's the most that's that can one of the most helpful ways to uh, look at Dante today, rather than just as a literary figure or whatnot. Because we're, I, I you know, I watch the news. We're in uh, quite a world crisis. Yeah, it's quite shocking, and the parallels between the Dark Age that ensued not long after Dante's death. Uh, Dante died in 1321. The Black Plague broke out in uh, 1346, I believe. And this took over Europe. Uh, Europe was already in a mental dark age, an intellectual dark age, shall we say, which we'll talk more about. And then the plague came. Uh, and, you know, there's... There, there's, there's a relationship between that. Um, doesn't help that we're in a pandemic now. Uh, things speed, are speeding up a bit. Uh, we've been in a mental dark age for a while. And uh, now we also have that parallel of a pandemic, whatever we think its causes. Uh, the world is in a lot of chaos. So I think it's interesting to read what Dante is best known for his work, the comedy, uh, Christened Divine by Boccaccio. How many people are, are familiar with uh, the comedy or have read it? Can I, can I see a... Not, no. Not, I only see four screens, but uh, I'm assuming, that, oh, I think I can see more. So most people are or not. So I, I can see four more screens, you guys, raise your hands. Familiar or not? Yes. Okay. I see head shaking, good, okay. So let's see what Dante gives a definition of his comedy, right? What, his, which I think gives a good idea of how he's thinking about it. So forgive this, uh, it's not the best translation, but this is a letter he wrote to Can Grande, who was the Duke of Verona, the ruler of Verona at the time, and he dedicated uh, Paradise, the third canticle, to this Duke. Um, Dante had been in exile for many years, for something like uh, 20 years. The last 20 years of his life, he was just wandering, uh, having been politically defeated in terms of the battle that he was waging. And uh, it's, it's during this exile that he uh, decided to compose the comedy, which became the ultimate intervention into the kind of uh, Christ, ultimate intervention and highest quality of answer to the kind of crisis that he was facing. So he writes to Can Grande, in order, sorry, my screen is blocking. There you go. In order to understand, you need to know that comedy comes from Comos, village, and Oda, which means song. 
once comedy sort of means country song. And comedy is a kind of poetic narration different from all others. It differs therefore from the tragedy in matter by the fact that tragedy in the beginning is admirable and quiet. In the end or final exit, it is smelly and horrible. Not the best translation, but, and it gets its name because of this from tragos, which means goat and oda, sort of like goat song, that is smelly like a goat, as can be seen in Seneca's tragedies. But comedy begins with harshness in something, whereas its matter ends in a good way, as can be seen by Terence in his comedies. As from this, it is obvious that the present work is called a comedy. And if we look at the matter, in the beginning, it is horrible and smelly because of Inferno. In the end, it is good, desirable, and graceful, for it is paradiso. As to the manner of speaking, it is easy and humble because it is in the vulgar tongue in which also women communicate. Sorry. And thus it is obvious why it is called comedy. So this is Dante on his comedy. Uh, it's, it's interesting the way he, he frames it. And uh, he speaks of the vulgar tongue, right? So the, the thing is that Italian as a, as a unified language didn't exist. Uh, and this is one of the major problems. Uh, and we have this problem today, but in a, in due to the degeneration of our common language, but there was no common language in that time. So you just had a bunch of scattered dialects across Italy and it, mm -hmm. in his, uh, his essay on the eloquence of the vernacular, Dante does something which, was, uh, which wasn't very popular back then, which is that he comes up defending the vernacular, Italian, as a language, as opposed to Latin, uh, which is what dominated. So Latin was like an elite language, an intellectual language uh, with fixed laws, and uh, it didn't change, and it was understood by only, uh, you know, quote-unquote, highly educated people, people who had a chance to really go through the education system. So Dante is here putting forward the idea that we need our own illustrious vernacular and we need our own refined language but in which we can communicate beautiful ideas. And I mean there's there's a lot that could be said about that but I, I was thinking about how today even in, in these classes, there's been a discussion about language, rhetoric, right? If we think of beautiful language today, unfortunately, what comes to mind, uh, at least for me, is you see it used by, you know, evil politicians, by sophists. You see languages used uh, in the media to, you know, euphemisms and all sorts of sort of Orwellian uh, methods of, of, of covering and veiling uh, evil intentions or, or, you know, all sorts of conspiracies, quite frankly, um, you know. So language really has deteriorated in terms of content and it's become just something that, you know, I, I think of, uh, you know, recent presidents, you know, I, I was thinking about Obama just because I remember watching this thing on television where, and the whole thing about uh, that time was people were freaking out about how well Obama spoke and everybody was so enthralled uh, and raptured by his rhetoric and his language and it got people so pumped up. But I remember watching just people were being interviewed after Obama spoke here in Montreal and they said, uh, you know, what did you think of Obama? Uh, what did you think of the conference? And they said, Oh, it was great. He, he just speaks so well. And they said, well, what did he say? And the person couldn't really answer. They were just like, I, I, I'm not sure. It, it, they, I forget exactly, you know, quote unquote, but they said they, they didn't really know what he said. They just said, I just love listening to him. And so this is often what we, I, I, I find this is more and more what beautiful language or the idea of beautiful language we have today is more this language that is, will woo you, that you can use to seduce. Uh, and, you know, people who speak very well aren't necessarily speaking very well because they wish to do good. They're speaking very well because they want to deceive you. They want to convince you of something. 
So here we have the, uh, the flip side. What is, what is the purpose of having a beautiful language? What is, what is the real necessity for having a poetic language in our culture? How do we develop that? And yeah, if you look at today, we've, we've largely lost that. Uh, that people think in very literal terms, everybody is, uh, you know, people are attacked more for how they say things, right? Political correctness is largely about the words you use and what you say, not really the content or the ideas. So this is the opposite. We want to know, we want to look at poetry, discover poetry, which allows us to communicate what we can't through just literal language, through just normal everyday speech. But at the same time, Dante calls it a vernacular because it's, if we want to communicate higher ideas, it has to be in a language that can be understood by all men. And so this is the purpose of his comedy. So just to talk a bit about the world Dante lived in, the medieval world. Um, oh wait, Dave? Yeah? Uh, just getting a message here from George, who's, who's saying preachers oh. hear this all the time. What did I say? I don't know. People, oh, maybe that's, maybe, no, maybe that was more for the end. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I thought that was something to inter uh, interject. Sorry. No, but just say what the question was for the book. What was that? Uh, Dave, um, uh, maybe just a note for people, because it's kind of hard for the presenter to see uh, questions. If you have an important question, um, maybe... Mm -hmm wait for a good time to ask it because it's very hard for the presenter to go into the chat. But uh, George Hartwell had a, a question earlier on, Dave, about oh, sure. what did you mean about the uh, Dante defending vulgar language and why does Dante like vulgar language? Well, that's the thing. He was saying that at the time, Latin was the language of, you know, the erudite. And the average person didn't speak Latin. So how are we supposed to communicate the necessary concept, the concepts necessary to develop ourselves, our character, our minds, our society, if there's no common language, or if the language that is developed is only accessible to very few. So this is why Italian didn't really exist as a, as a unified language. It's not like uh, today, you know, it's really there was an idea of dialects where you have to imagine when you, I mean, extreme, you know, slang today, I guess, is the closest thing, right? There's all these different slangs. Young people have a different slang depending on where, what part of, uh, you know, the United States you go to, right? Deep South or Brooklyn or something. There's going to be a different, quote unquote, vernacular, if you will. And imagine there was only that. Imagine there wasn't a common language uh, to communicate with. There were all these dialects and everybody was just sort of clashing. Uh, all the regions were based on these different dialects. Each had a, its own duke, its, its fiefdoms, fiefdoms. And uh, they were just, it was incessant war. There was no nation of Italy. There was no national language. And so you know, from the standpoint that Dom is intervening, so, yeah, so in Dante's time, Dante was a member of the Guelph party, right? The battle in Florence, Dante was uh, a Florentine, was between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, were different, which were different uh, factions of the nobility. And so the nobility was a constant war. Uh, you know, every region was sort of ruled by a different person who had his own personal interest. Uh, the papacy, uh, the Ghibellines were on the side of the emperor and the Guelphs were on the side of the papacy. And so these different factions are allied with the Pope or emperor and they're all fighting, uh, you know, from the top down, they're trying to gain control over different parts of Italy. And it just, it, it doesn't stop. It's just continuous war. So Dante was a member of the Guelphs and the way he rose to power, I mean, the way he wrote his first, the way he first found fame was through his beautiful lyrics, his early lyrics uh, in Italian. And he, it was only by his talent. He was, he came from, 
uh, a family which had, you know, uh, noble blood, if you will, but had been long since, uh, you know, uh, fallen out of power. They, they, they had lost their riches and all that. So Dante was not uh, in a very uh, high position in his society. But he, he gained fame through his, uh, through his development of his beautiful lyrics of Italian, the vernacular. And this is how he met other leading uh, figures in his society. Guido Cavalcante, who was the leading poet at that time. And uh, Brunetto Latini, who was an ambassador to uh, Byzantium and the court of Alfonso in Spain. And, uh, you know, Dante was able to rub shoulders with the with the nobility thanks to his talent which he his early talent which he developed and he quickly rose to uh he quickly he rose to power he became one of the six priors for the city of florence uh that was in 1300 he was born in uh 1256 and he quickly gained power and he did a lot to try and intervene politically he, uh, it's interesting, he wrote letters to the, just to give an idea, he wrote letters to uh, King Henry VII, who was, to be, who was the emperor, which has become the emperor. He wrote letters to the cardinals, and he laid out his principles of the De Monarchia, which uh, is a very important work, or it's significant in that what he lays out is the need to restore the emperor, he, he makes a distinction between the spiritual world and the temporal world, and that what needs to happen if we're to bring order back uh, into Europe, into the world, is that we have to, the emperor has to be in charge of the temporal things of this world, while the papacy is in charge of the spiritual world. But the papacy, state, uh, church, church and state, should be separate. At the time he was living in, there, everything was just, you know, a war, all out war, each faction trying to gain control. So he laid out the conception of the separation between church and state. That was Dante. And so he tried to intervene. He sent letters to all sorts of people. He fought to get all sorts of policies through. But ultimately, the world he lived in, tactically, it wasn't possible because of the wars and the, the, there was just, there were no state institutions yet. Everything was controlled by this nobility and the, the incessant war among this nobility. And he was exiled. He was exiled in 1201. And oh, I think I see a lot of questions. Is that it? Is that? Just a comment. I'm just throwing comments in. Oh, you, I, I don't mind hearing it. It's, it, it could help. It's fine. I, I just, yeah, you're, you may as well. Yeah, just say a comment or something. Well, if I, the comment I have about the use of vulgar and, and even common language today or great writers is that they put insights and sometimes they, these insights are part of the common language. They put insights into literature and therefore capture insights that the people say may have, but the elite and you're saying the Latin will not include these insights, but the great writer may catch them and then you just said he has this insight about the separation of church and state and he's putting that into his writing so it may have been his own insight but he's capturing it in the common language and therefore it may enter into the to the thought of the common people where he starts circulating that idea yeah and it did actually the de monarchia was something that circulated during his lifetime and was discussed by uh he had dante had we won't call them students, but if you will, disciples, Boccaccio, Petrarch, these people all studied Dante. They were in with uh, the other, you know, leading, uh, let's call them, what became, Dante basically laid the ground for humanism. And he developed a language in which humanistic ideas could be developed. And I mean, there's, there's so much to say in terms of the, how awful the world was that he lived in. Uh, but to give another example, apart from the war and the, the, the dark age in terms of the, the temporal, if we will, there was the intellectual dark age. 
which I'd like to go to. Uh, yeah, and so to get a sense of this, I, it, it's, uh, I, I want to quote a letter from Petrarch, who was one of Dante's disciples. They only met once, but uh, Petrarch's father was an allied Guelph uh, with Dante and was also exiled at the same time. So there is a, a direct link there. But one of the main problems was the scholasticism, the reign of Aristotle over the intellectual world that Dante lived in. There was no, Greek, just thought that. There was no uh, you know, knowledge of the ancients uh, had been lost. Just to really get a sense of that, the la Greek language was not, nobody really knew the Greek language anymore. Uh, Petrarch tried to learn it, Boccaccio, they got people to uh, translate. But during Dante's time, it was really darkness, darkness. But what is the nature of that? I think it's, it's well captured in what Petrarch says about his time. And he's, this is from a, a little essay he writes about, uh, he had these four Venetian friends and they really loved Aristotle. And this is what Petrarch says. He, he went, he would see them, they would, they would visit. I would then either remain, and they would talk about Aristotle. I would then either remain silent or jest with them or change the subject. Sometimes I asked with a smile, how Aristotle could have known that, for it was not proven by the light of reason, nor could it be tested by experiment. At that they would fall silent in surprise and anger, as if they regarded me as a blasphemer who asked any proof beyond the authority of Aristotle. So we bid, so we bid fair to be no longer philosophers, lovers of the truth, but Aristotelians, or rather Pythagoreans reviving the absurd custom which permits us to ask no question except whether he said it. I believe, indeed, that Aristotle was a great man and that he knew very much, yet he was but a man, and therefore something, nay many things, may have escaped him. I will say more. I am confident beyond doubt that he was in error all his life, not only as regards small matters, where a mistake counts for little, but in the most weighty questions, where his supreme interests were involved. And al although he has said much of happiness, both at the beginning and the end of his ethics, I dare assert, let my critics exclaim as they may, that he was so completely ignorant of true happiness that the opinions upon this matter of any pious old woman or devout fisherman, shepherd or farmer would if not so fine spun be more to the point than this. <laughs> So basically a peasant woman was wiser than Aristotle, <laughs> what uh, Petrarch was saying. And just to add one more thing, he says they, these schoolmen say much of beasts, birds, and fishes, discuss how many hairs there are on the lion's head and feathers and the hawk's tail, and how many coils the polypus winds about a wrecked ship. They expatiate upon the generation of the elephant and its biennial offspring, as well upon the docility and intelligence of and its resemblance to humankind. They tell how the phoenix lives two or three centuries and is then consumed by an aromatic fire to be born again from its ashes. Even if all these things were true, they help in no way toward a happy life. For what does it advantage, for what does it advantage is to be familiar, if to be familiar with the nature of animals, birds, fish, and reptiles while we are ignorant of the nature of the race of man to which we belong. Or care whence we came or whither we go. And so this was really the problem. It actually dawned on me in working on this presentation, how insidious the Aristotelian worldview is and how it just permeates all our institutions what he's saying, what Petrarch's really attacked is, you know, he says, for it was not proven by light, the light of reason, nor could it be tested by experiment. And this is really something uh, I, you can really, uh, you know, th that defines Aristotle, right? He uses logic and makes all sorts of assertions, but how do we know the things that he's assuming as the basis for all his syllogisms are true? 
there's nothing in his philosophy that gets us the challenge to inquire as to the causes of things, the, the true causality of what we see, right? Because he uses logic and logic is only as good as its assumptions. But how do you investigate assumptions? It's really by experiment and by reason in the sense of why is something necessarily this way and not some way. That's a I, cause. I, and yeah, just to finish, the, the, the nature of causality, you can't see a cause. You can see the effect of a cause, right? But you can't see a cause as such. You can give an example of anything. You can see how something happened. You can see the mechanism. Our, our sensorium experiences the universe in a continuous process, but what guides that process? What shapes that process? What are the principles that underlie that process? You can't know that through the senses. You can only know that through reason. Uh, and Leibniz defines this as the principle of necessary and sufficient reason. That really it's only through the mind that we can know why things are. And so this is what Petrarch's uh, attacking with Aristotelianism and his Venetian friends. And Venice is really the thing that had spread Aristotelianism uh, across Europe, especially through, there was this uh, Arab philosopher, Averos, and he was translated, he was one of the big commentators uh, on Aristotle. And this is really what reigned. So there was no, there, it was a world of false assumptions, right? And people were stuck in a system that didn't allow you to question assumptions. And this is, if you do that for long enough, if that system reigns for long enough, you descend into hell because nobody is really investigating the real universe anymore. We're just using a bunch of formulas, assumptions that we have and organizing our society based on that without regard to whether it's true or not. Can I, can I comment in here, David? Sure. Because it's, it's much more than Aristotle and it, it's what's being outlined here is probably the most important shift or revolution in Western culture from respect for authority and those in authority and what they say to a whole different um, way of understanding what is true, which we now would call say science or or the the uh, the testing of truth and it's not so i'm saying it's not just aristotle it's it's the church because all church services were in latin and not the vernacular nobody had a bible to read nobody could think for themselves yeah and this could be true say in in china where what is done is done based on a great respect for past generations and authority and tradition. So to shift to something that, to shift to a principle like this is to undermine completely uh, the historical direction of the culture and it opens us up to the possibility of science and technology and helps explain why uh, what we call the West developed science and technology and gained an advance in that. I mean, this, this seems to me is the crucial shift in thinking happening right here with Dante and his disciples. Well, yeah, there, that's, well, that's the interesting thing that Dante really, the comedy, that's the thing, Dante lost all the political battles of his lifetime, given the world that he was in, there was really no way at that time to do something about it. His intervention came through poetry, but it wasn't just poetry. It wasn't just some sort of romantic, uh, you know, poetry, just praising, uh, you know, uh, writing about the beauty of nature, the beauty of some beloved or whatnot. He used poetry to make a spiritual intervention into his society. Mm. And create a language that could address the greatest paradoxes of human nature so that people actually had the means to deal with these higher questions. And poetry 
has a new, unique way of doing that, which is much more compelling than uh, some, you know, consecutive reasoning, some ra just rational argument. Right? Poetry really gets at the the essence of something. Right? It's, it's something that we're it it compels from us. It challenges us to find within ourselves, mm -hmm. not just whether we're we think this is right or not. It's an image of man. And that's really, yeah, the, the, with the comedy, but throughout all of Dante's uh, life and his poetry, I think the question, the question of what universe are we in is really what it comes down to, right? The poetry, poetry is a reflection of the universe the poet lives in. And so by investigating the comedy, we're really, it's an investigation of the universe, of what universe we're in. What is man's relationship to this universe? And I think there's, there's some relevant questions, you know, in terms of what universe are we in? I've heard the argument today, the universe is indifferent to man, right? That, that may be the case. Is the universe indifferent to who we are? Does it really matter? You know, we have our own system. Man has his own way of organizing his society. Who cares what the universe is doing? The universe is indifferent, so we have no right to, there is no morality as such. There are just systems. And we can just logically deduce what the best system is based on whatever we think, whatever world we think we live in. So the question of actually getting it, well, hang on, what is the universe that we live in? That should be the ultimate question. And uh, in, with Dante, the question of, well, there's creation, there's the created, and there's the creator, and the relationship between the three, understanding okay. what is the principle that shapes this universe that we're investigating. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it indifferent? That's really going to decide how we proceed, right? So this is what Don, this is how Dante is intervening into his society. It, it was necessary. And so I would read something. Does somebody else want to read? Uh, this quote by Shelley on the nature of poetry. Can I just interrupt with a question, Dave? Sure. Sorry, I don't see the questions. Uh, well, that's okay. Um, in regard to Dante, in regard to Averroes, um, have you studied much of Al-Ghazali at all? No, I know a bit of, like, I, I know a bit, but no, I'm not, uh, I haven't extensively read. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll just um, email you some stuff then. I think you'll find it really interesting. It's a very, very interesting parallel because basically Al-Ghazali won his battles against Ibn Rushd and that had particular impacts on the Muslim world. Um, yeah, that, that's, it's, again, the parallels, are, but in, in a reverse way, are, are very fascinating. Right. I know some things about that, but yeah, just, yeah, that's gonna, I think there's plenty that could be said there, but just in terms of, yeah, just we'll, for now, we'll just get back. Uh, there's somebody, would you like to read the, the quote? Are you talking about Lionel? Lionel, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. But poets or those who imagine and express this indestructible order are not only the authors of language and of music, of the dance and architecture and statuary and painting, they are the institutors of laws and the founders of civil society and the inventors of the arts of life and the teachers who draw into a certain propaniquity with the beautiful and the true, that partial apprehension of the agencies of the invisible world, which is called religion. Hence, all original religions are allegorical or susceptible of allegory, and like Janus, have a double face of false and true. Poets, according to the circumstances of the age and nation in which they appeared, were called in the earlier epochs of the world legislators or prophets. A poet essentially comprises and unites both these characters, for he not only beholds intensely the present as it is, and discovers those laws according to which present things ought to be ordered, but he beholds the future in the present, and his thoughts are the germs of the flower and the fruits of the latest time. Not that I assert poets to be prophets in the gross sense of the word, or that they can foretell the form as surely as they foreknow the spirits of the events. Such is the pretense of superstition, 
which would make poetry an attribute of prophecy rather than prophecy an attribute of poetry. A poet participates in the eternal, the infinite, and the one, as far as relates to its conceptions, time and place and number are not. The grammatical forms which express the moods of time and the difference of persons and the distinction of place are convertible with respect to the highest poetry without enduring it, it as poetry. And the choruses of Aes, Chiles, and the Book of Job and Dante's Paradise would afford more than any other writings examples of this fact if the limits of this essay did not forbid citation. Shelley, a defense of poetry. Right. Okay, a lot said there. But this is really defying the highest calling of the poet. And it's very interesting to read Dante from his early works to his mature works. And what scholars have, I, I was just reading some different commentaries and, and what one pointed out, one scholar pointed out is that they marveled that there, it seemed nobody had written with such a, a unity, with, with a single purpose in all his works throughout his life. And so as you read, even from the early poetry and you just see how he matures as a person to developing the final, uh, his final all encompassing work, the comedy. It's really for personal development, intele intellectual development. It's really something to look at all of Dante's works because yeah, people know the comedy, but some of his uh, canzoni, his lyric poems, uh, showcase this internal struggle, this, this, this mission, this tension in the poet that he was seeking to, uh, you know, develop and unfold throughout his life. It's in these, it's in all his poetry. And so it's interesting to see how it develops. I would just want to read before, because we're going to read a bit of Dante. And I, I want to actually read, and, and that's the thing. It says, examples of this fact, if the limits of this essay did not forbid citation, this presentation does not forbid citation. So we're, go we're going to citate. But I just want to lay out a bit of, throw out some things in terms of how to think about what we're going to read. So Shelley, in his preface to Prometheus Unbound, writes, the imagery which I have employed will be found in many instances to have been drawn from the operations of the human mind, or from those external actions by which they are expressed. This is unusual in modern poetry, although Dante and Shakespeare are full of instances of the same kind. Dante, indeed more than any other poet, and with greater success. And Dante writes, for we see many things with our mind for which vocal signs are lacking, as Plato tells us well in his books by taking on metaphors, for he saw many things with the light of his mind, which he was not able to express in his words. So this is where Dante's coming from. Poetry is a vehicle to express what cannot be said literally, which becomes the kind of language necessary if we're really going to deal with the nature of the universe, you know, when we're saying what universe are we in, it's not like what is it made of, you know, what is it physically, like what kind of box are we in, but it's no, what is, that's, that's a literal, that's one way, that's, that's, that's a first level, but there are other questions, there are other qualitative questions that we have, that we want to investigate, and Dante talks about this, I, I just thought before, uh, we get into some poetry. Uh, he writes in his uh, banquet, it's called the, con the, the Convivio. He writes about, he, he, was, he wrote, it's a, it's, a, it's a prose, it's an essay in the vernacular where he breaks down and looks at his own poetry. And he's complaining that a lot of people love his poetry and think it's very beautiful, but they don't know what it means. They don't know what it's actually saying. So he wrote the banquet, the convivio, and developed and broke down and analyzed his own poems to show how they worked and what he was actually trying to say. So 
he lays out four different kinds of meanings. And I just wanted to, to throw that in so that when we look at his poetry, we're keeping this in mind. And, uh, does somebody want to read? I vote for Jerry. <laughs> Jerry's on mute. Oh, he can fix that. There we go. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep. You're good. Okay, the banquet. I say, as was recounted in the first chapter, that this exposition must be both literal and allegorical. And to explain what this means, it is needful to know that writing can be understood and should be expounded in four main ways. The first is termed the literal. And this is the meaning that in poetic fables, for instance, does not delve beneath the surface of the words. The next is termed the allegorical, and this meaning is concealed beneath the cloak of the fables, and is a truth hidden beneath a lovely fiction. So Ovid says that with his lyre Orpheus tamed wild beasts and made the trees and rocks come to him at his call, which is to say that the wise man with the instrument of his voice makes harsh hearts tender and humble and moves at will those who do not devote their lives to knowledge and art and that those who have no rational life at all are almost like stone. The third meaning is the moral one and this is the meaning that teachers should seek to uncover throughout the scriptures for their own and their people's benefit. So, for example, in the Gospels, we may see that Christ took with him only three of the apostles when he climbed the mount to be transfigured, the moral sense of which is that in matters of great secrecy, we should have few companions. One last one. Okay. <clears throat> the fourth meaning is termed anagogical or anagogical, that is to say beyond the senses, and is revealed when writings are expounded in a spiritual sense, which, although they are true in the literal sense, also signifies by means of symbols an aspect of the divine glory of eternal things, as can be seen in the Psalm of the Prophet, which reads, that when the children of Israel went out of Egypt, Judea was rendered whole and free. For though it is clearly true according to the letter, what is intended to be taken spiritually is no less true. Namely, that when the soul departs from sin, it is made whole and free in its powers. In this kind of explanation, the literal should always be treated first as being the meaning of which the others are enclosed and without which it would be impossible and illogical to treat the other meanings, especially the allegorical. It would be impossible because with regard to all that has an outside and an inside, it is impossible to arrive at the inside without first arriving at the outside. Thus, given that in what is written, the outside is always the literal meaning. It is impossible to arrive at the outer me at the other meanings, especially the allegorical, without first arriving at the literal. Yeah, so this is how Dante is thinking when he's breaking down, when he's thinking about poetry and language. It's really not, I mean, today the way people think about poetry is just, and really art, and really thinking is feelings, right? It's all about feelings. How do I feel about something that was said, right? If we're looking at the political correctness firestorm these days, um, I mean, everybody's just getting, you get sacked if you say just, you know, slightly the wrong thing or slightly deviate from, you know, what is supposed to be the right thing you know, and it's assumed that you therefore mean the opposite, right? There's no nuance. There's really, there's no nuance today in what people are saying. Every, things have become so literal, uh, 
so black and white and there's no possibility of really having a truthful discussion anymore. Yeah, I was just thinking about uh, J.K. Ro JK Rowling's recent bizarre controversy, the author of uh, Harry Potter, which yeah. she basically said that in, in, in response to some comment uh, of referring to women as people who menstruate or people who, yeah, people who menstruate, rather than saying women, she just said, yeah, back in my day, I think we used to call them females. <laughs> And just by saying that, there was this huge uh, tidal wave of hate that fell upon her from all directions pr that, that were basically saying that she must hate transgenders and, and non-binaries and stuff. She must hate that based on what she just said. <laughs> As if she's like some Hitlerian uh, <laughs> person. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's, totally, it's totally nuts. You know what I mean? And you can't have a discussion of truth if you can't allow for nuance. And if you just go with your feelings. So here Dante is really laying out uh, something a lot more uh, complex, but this is really how language works. There's, if you want to communicate higher ideas, you have to be uh, ironies and paradoxes. We have to be conscious that there's more than just the words that people are saying. We have to think about what are the ideas and what relationship do these ideas have to the universe we live in? Do they make sense? Do they not? Instead of what's the right opinion, we should say, well, what does the universe think? And investigate from there what this opinion, how this opinion stands up to that. So just to get a bit more complex, uh, because, you know, we're talking about poetry. We should know how a poem works. And if you, it's interesting, I was, uh, I remember listening to a presentation uh, by somebody named Fred Haight, who gave a, uh, who's a music scholar and he gave a presentation on uh, poetic recitation uh, and the nature of language and he pointed out that poetry in German is Dichtung which means uh, condensed so what we're dealing with in poetry is really a condensed form of language that is trying to get at something that we can't with just a broader or looser form of language and so Dante develops the idea of the stanza. He formalizes a lot of the uh, poetic rules in his essay. And he calls the basic unit of a poem a stanza. Stanza means room in Italian. And it can also be, uh, in English, we would say, uh, there's also the idea of a strophe. So I wanted to read, just to keep this in mind, uh, a LaRouche on a, uh, in his essay on Hobbes, how Hobbes' mathematics The strophe is a, is, a, is a poetical unit. So the strophe provides a repeated yet varied structure for the poem. The change of vowels and consonants in contrast of one strophe to each of the others provides a degree of contrapuntal irony to the repeated common aspect of successive strophes, successive stanzas, successive couplets. The imagery of ideas in the verse as such provides another degree of contrapuntal irony. So you have the sounds of the vowels, the shape of the lines, the color of the lines, right? Dark words, light words, Dante says hairy words, smooth words, and you can use these to modulate where there's a verbal irony, there's a verbal action which reflects a certain change in idea. So he says, the imagery of ideas in the verse as such provides another degree of contrapuntal irony. It is the juxtaposition of these ironies which generates paradoxes. The form known as the classical strophic poem provides the poet thus a medium whose potential is a nest of paradoxes. Within the stanza, among the stanzas, and in the poem taken as a unit whole. So we're dealing with paradoxes here. Poetry is paradoxes, nuance. And, you know, it's been said that poetic thinking, poetic irony, really is the origin of scientific thinking. That when we're investigating the universe, right, we're, which we experience through our senses, we're really investigating ironies. We're investigating paradoxes, things that we can't just explain through our senses. And we're looking to make sense of it. 
to find this higher meaning, this metaphorical meaning that can, that sheds light on what it is we're actually experiencing. So that's, that's the process in a poem. So on the left side, we have a schematic rendering Dante's canzone, a typical stanza. So uh, I got this from a great article called um, Dante and the, the Power of Poetry, Dante, his Commedia and the Creation of the Nation State, uh, something like that by Muriel. Uh, I forget what her name is, from the Schiller Institute. It's from the 90s. Uh, it's a great article. And so anyway, she divides up, Dante breaks up a stanza. Uh, I, okay, we have, here's one stanza. Uh, so the, the lines are Hendica syllables. So there are 11 syllables and there's, they're stressed based on the way the Italian language works. They're stressed at the sixth and the 10th syllables. So each line has certain stresses and specific places which reflect the, the, the general movement, the natural flow of Italian. And he breaks the stanza up into feet. Each foot is a series of lines that have a rhyme pattern. So the first foot ends, the first rhyme is A, then B is a new rhyme, B again, it's the same, it's, I mean, it's, it rhymes with the first line, the, sorry, the second line. C, new, new rhyme, or new word, a now rhymes with the first line. So the fifth line rhymes with the first line. B, B returns. So the second and third line are repeated in the sixth and seventh. And C, the eighth, uh, the fourth and the eighth line. So that defines the rhymes. It defines a, is a musical movement from foot to foot, from strophe to strophe. And then Dante has the idea of the volta it calls the the diesis is as a musical term which is a change from one melody the the pattern that was repeated in the first two feet to a new melody and so this volta this turn is marked by a rhyme as well so you have cc a new rhyme and then it goes into this new series c d e e d f d f g g so this is all a movement of idea there's a development something's going on there's a musical idea that's being carried and this is just to show that there's a shape and so we want to use the poet uses these movements these these verbal actions to create certain changes and developments in our mind so for example a first stanza here of one of dante's canzone his songs it goes, Amor che movi tua virtù da cielo, e come il sole splendore, B, che lì s'apprende più lo suo valore, B, dove più nobilità suo raggio trova. That's one foot. Now it comes back. E come il fuga oscuritate e gelo, rhymes with the first line. Così alto signore, tu cacci la viltate altrui del cuore, rhymes with the last line. Ne ira contra te fa lunga prova. C comes back. Da te conven che ciascun ben si muova, the diesis, the turn, per lo qual si travia il mondo tutto. Sanza te distrutto. And this is a shorter line. There's a stress, there's a tension. Without you is destroyed whatever power we have, quanto avemo in potenzia di ben fare, whatever power we have to do good. Come pintura in tenebrosa parte, like a painting in a dark room, che non si può mostrare, ne dar diletto di color ne d'arte. That can't be seen or give the light of, uh, of color or art. And what's very interesting with it, it's there's so much stress. The, uh, Italian is all about these, these long and short stresses, and, and this really pauses tension. And this is how the idea is unfolding. So we can follow that. We can follow what the poet is actually saying, not just through his words, but the actions of his mind. So I want to read one, which is a very compelling canzone. It's very powerful. 
imagery wise, we're not at the comedy yet, but this is one of the poet, the canzone, one of his songs that he wrote. Um, how old was he? If he's 12, he's six, six, 76, 86. Almost when he was uh, like, when he was like 35. So is it a, uh, a translation you did, Dave, or is this? Uh... Yeah, this is a this is a translation I did, and that's part of what's fun because uh, what I, what I read before, it was hard to enjoy the poem because it was it was very much transliterated. There's not there aren't many good uh, translations of Dante. That's part of the problem, right? There's a there's a good tra there are translation plenty of translations of the comedy, but all his other poems that he wrote throughout his life, many of them, the longer, uh, the canzone, the songs, they're not really accessible in English. So I set out to translate a lot of them. Uh, I want to translate them all. And I find it's like a hidden, it's like a, it's like a midpoint in his development. If we really want to get a sense of the tension and everything boiling inside that takes this final beautiful metaphor of the comedy, it's really in these. And so I, I find there's really a lot uh, to be learned. And the lyric, it's very personal. The epic poem is very large and grandiose, but the lyric is much more personal. So it's interesting to see uh, how Dante's thinking. And we want to remember it's not literal, right? We don't just want to see this poem as literal. But here's what it says, and we'll, we'll talk about it after. Just try and let it unfold. I'll try and make the reading at least somewhat uh, fun. So, io son venuto al punto della rota. I've come to the conjunction of the wheel, where the horizon meets the sunset and traces Gemini within the skies. As love's own star into the distance steals, its bright light is by the sun's rays met, such that a veil is cast, which belies its light. And the sphere which shields the frost lies in sight along the great celestial arc, where the seven cast a faint shadow. And yet it does not follow that even the faintest thoughts of love depart from my mind, which has become a hardened stone, storing those thoughts of love as if in stone. Rising from the scorching Ethiopian sands, the pilgrim winds stir all the air as they're warmed by the sun's resplendent rays. And as the winds cross over distant lands, so is the copious snow spread everywhere, such that if not disturbed, it coldly stays. And scattering its flakes, it falls and lays its sheets of frigid snow and plaguing rains. While love, as all the sky so sadly weeps, seeks solace from the storm. And yet he keeps my heart still clenched. With aching pines, he never leaves. So beautiful, this woman. So beautiful and cruel. My only woman. Fled is each bird as it trails the warmer season from European lands, which keeps its sight on those seven frigid stars above. The others rest their voices with no reason to cry or sing until the sun again brightens our lands and paints them green from above. And all the beasts, by nature lively and in love, now recede into nature's womb, freed as their spirits are tamed by the cold season. Yet mine is ever inflamed. Not a word of liberation is decreed on my behalf, while my sweet thoughts with time are so quickly taken, taken by one with little time. Gone are the greener leaves, their term elapsed when they adorn the world, and dead is the grass. So all the boughs of green have fled our sight, save for the laurel sprigs, or pine and fir trees, for all whose leaves through every season last. And how bitter is the season past that has killed the flowers on each bank, too pretty and frail to withstand the frost. And yet the thorn is never lost, sunk deep in my heart's softened flank, such that I have resolved to forever bear her, even if this pain is forever. I'm blocked. 
fled is each bird as it trails the warmer season. Yes, yeah, sir. There's a bar. Yeah, you're good. Fled is each bird as it trails the warmer season from European lands, which keeps its sight on those seven frigid stars above. The others rest their voices with no reason to cry or sing until the sun again alights our lands and paints them green from above. And all the beasts, by nature lively, and in love now recede into nature's womb, freed as their spirits are tamed by poison. Yet mine is ever inflamed. Not a word of, oh, I read that, I apologize. <laughs> Not a word, yet yeah, on my behalf, with my sweet thoughts with time are so quickly taken, taken by one with little time. Gone are the green leaves. Sorry. Gone are the green leaves. Their turn elapsed. I, I read that, no? Yeah, so all the bells, yeah. Sorry, I think I, I pasted it. Uh, one, two, three, four. I apologize. So everything I read, we just had to read that last. He says, my song. What will soon become of me in the new sweet season when the warm rains fall like flames of love from the skies? If love even now still lies in me while in the other beings he refrains from being felt, I must soon turn to marble for this fair maiden's heart is made of marble. Okay. I apologize for that mixed up reading there. I was pasting back and forth earlier. It doesn't hurt to hear it again. Pardon me? It doesn't hurt to hear it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, I mean this is this is a this is a very interesting one. Let's let's just compare it. Okay, before we say anything on this, there's there's much complexity here, right? It seems he's talking about astronomical cycles, he's talking about all sorts of different levels of nature you know, from the atmosphere to the bowels of the earth to the beasts that migrate to sleep. Passion has fled. And yet even as all the beasts have retreated, he's still there. He's still compelled by something. I just want to read um, one of his earlier lyrics, one, like some of the early songs, just to compare, to get a sense of development and how the poet is is thinking here's one of the early ones that got him you know that 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 got him fame as i rode forth one day not long ago pensive about my journey and distressed i met love like a traveler humbly dressed coming along my path forlorn and slow such wretchedness his aspect seemed to show he might have been a monarch dispossessed with thoughtful steps and sign, he progressed, his gaze averted and his head held low. When he caught sight of me, he called my name and said, from far away, I bring your heart where it has dwelt according to my will and take it a new service to fulfill. That I absorbed of him so great a part, he vanished just as strangely as he came. Nice, very, there's a mystical, religious sort of feeling there. Love throughout his life, Dante talks about love this, and this lady that is um, calling him, following him, influencing him. Everything he does is, is compelled by this, this strange lady. And here in this, um, in this poem, these are called the, uh, the stone rhymes because in these ones, in the canzone, there's another three like this one uh, that we've read, Io son venuto al punto della rota. The lady is very harsh. There's a, there's, there's a, a coldness and harshness about what he's describing. And a lot of the Dante scholars, the Dantisti, there's always this discussion about, well, who's, which lady is he talking about here? You know, who's this lady in this one? Is that, is that the same lady here? Uh, you know, when did that lady die? You know, when was she born? 
And so there's all this back and forth as if it's just some literal woman. But the more and more of these canzone that we read, the more and more it becomes clear that it's not the lady that's changed so much as it's his relationship to this lady. And we see constantly changing, constantly different portraits of himself, different states of mind. And so this one, this stone rhyme, the Rime Petrose, this one, Io sem venuto al ponto della rota, is very interesting because compared to his early lyrics, which are just love is this mystical spirit thing that is compelling him. It's calling him. It's virtuous. He describes it with all sorts of, you know, virtuous, noble adjectives. Here it's a lot harsher, but the poem is also constructed in a very, uh, there's, there are many degrees, there are many levels to this poem. He's describing the, the, the cycle in the skies, the alignment, uh, the conjunction. I, I, I had to look this stuff up. I'm no expert, but the, I, I, read, I read a fair amount into it in order to understand it. But it's interesting. He's talking about the conjunction between Venus and the sun when he says, uh, and love's own star into the distance steals. Its bright light is by the sun's rays met, such that a veil is cast, which belies its light. And the sphere which shields the frost lies in sight along the great celestial arc. So these are astronomical observations. And as I, what I was reading in this work that really breaks it all down, it's referring to a, it's, it's referring to the specific year in which Dante wrote this, which was December 24th, 1296. Like that's when that conjunction would have happened. And you know, when all these alignments would have happened. But what's interesting, because we're talking about the idea of what universe are we in? And we see in the early poems that Dante is really dealing with this idea of love, praise of love, and looking for something spiritual, though, and trying to define its qualities, the qualities of this spiritual thing. In this later poem, Dante, there's a consciousness of the cosmos in which Dante is in. He's, he's growing more conscious of the, of the universe he's in, and it's, bec it's becoming more and more present in his descriptions of the world, in his experience. So there's a, there's a maturity, and the way it's breaking down, uh, it points out in this paper I was reading, because it's not obvious, rising from the beginning, it starts from the top the conjunction of the wheel where the horizon meets the sun he's coming from the uppermost levels of the cosmos the celestial sphere and then rising from the scorching ethiop in the second stanza rising from the scorching ethiopian sands the pilgrim winds stir all the air warmed by the sun's resplendent rays there's now the influence of the stars of the sun reaching the earth and then in the next stanza fled is each bird as it trails the warmer season from European lands, which keeps its sight on the seven frigid stars. So there's new, uh, you know, descending levels of nature of the world. Gone are the green leaves, their term elapsed when they adorn the world, right down to the leaves, to the foliage of the earth. And yeah so it it just it, there i think i left out a stanza about the bowels of the earth but it's just to say that dante in this poem we're seeing more and more of the universe come into view and i think that's what's important mm -hmm. that as a poet as dante developed more and more he was asking this question which we all have to ask which is the nature of the universe how it works and what is our relationship to that? And philosophy, this struggle, this, this investigation can be very wrenching and difficult at times. And I think that's what Dante is really here communicating that this woman is like stone. She doesn't change, you know, regardless of what's going on, there's this 
constancy, but something compels him on, regardless of all the elements around him, regardless of winter, right? He says his, his passion doesn't, uh, there's, his passion doesn't wane. I must soon to marble if this fair maiden's heart is made of marble. So there's this tension between change and non-change and Dante's mission. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about Dante's development, where now we come to the comedy, which is the work that, you know, his capolavoro, as they say, the, the, his ultimate work. And so it's interesting that in the people that I've talked to about uh, the comedy or like that, I, that I've met, it's interesting that I noticed how people, I got this remark more than once or in, in different ways, that hell was very much familiar to readers than Dante's Paradise or even Purgatory. When people think of the Divine Comedy, most people think of the Inferno today. Uh, you know, I remember being in Italy, uh, this one guy said, yeah, the Inferno's the most interesting. And uh, I remember my English teacher, uh, one of English teachers, she said she only, she only read the Inferno. She never read the other ones, which is just very strange. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I didn't have time, I guess, to read the other, other sections. And I think, you know, if Dante was here, if Dante today was a modern poet, right, a modern artist, you know what, he would have probably only written the Inferno. Because today, art has largely just become, and it has been for a while, the 20th century art, modernist art, has been very much just a description of the horrors of the world, right? After the Holocaust, there was this whole discussion of like, how could we paint something like a Mona Lisa? Or how could we compose another Ninth Symphony after the horrors of the Holocaust. You know, how could you? But, <laughs> and it's, it's a challenging question in a sense. Well, are we really just supposed to like muse about beauty and praise, you know, nature and all that when you know such terrible things can happen? And so today art has really become hostage to the senses in a sense, because if art is just there to describe the world we live in, right, to describe and to shed light on the horrors of this world, how terrible humankind is. If that's really all art can do, and one is very just literal, you're really bound by whatever your world is. So art becomes hostage to whatever the present is. I was just thinking, David, that that's sort of what Aristotle also uh, defined art to be, right? Was a, a mimic, uh, a mimic of the external world and not much more than just yeah, being like a mirror of, not a creator of anything new that's not in the world outside of you physically. Yeah, so I mean, it's all, you, you, you could get lucky and end up in a beautiful world and the art's going to be beautiful, but if you're in an ugly <laughs> world, you know, the art's going to be ugly. So good thing Dante wasn't a modern, modernist poet. And he actually, he defined hell, but he also defined a way out. And this is the beauty of this, of this work. It's really this transcendental quality, this transformative power of basically, they're like three poems, I guess you could say. They're called canticles. So the comedy is divided into three canticles, uh, Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradise. And each canticle is divided into a series of, of books, chapters, cantos. And so what is hell like? These are some nice uh, etchings by Gustave Dalé, who uh, describe, who, you know, depicts many of the different scenes. There's a lot of beautiful art on the, on the comedy of paradise by, by especially Gustave Dalé, but many. And so in the Inferno, it begins, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. Che la diritta via smarita. 
in the midst of our life's way or in the middle of uh, my life's way, I nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. I found myself within a darkened forest, che la diritta viera era smarita, for I had lost the straight path. That's how the, the, the inferno opens. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing pop-ups here on my screen. And as Dante, right, the comedy is really bridging. There's so much that could be said. And I'm, I, I think I also see a lot of conversations here. Does anybody want to say anything? My screen just it pops up and I notice. Uh, are there any questions or anything? Okay. So the, the comedy is really, right, we talked about leadership and mission orientation. And that good thing that Dante had a vision. He wasn't just hostage to the hell that was in front of him. Dante harkens back to the ancients, to Virgil. He, he didn't have access to the Greek, but he, uh, to the ancient Greeks, to Homer and all that, but he had access to Virgil, uh, who was basically, Virgil was trying to, with his poem, from what I can understand, trying to set a basis or a foundation for the Roman Empire as the continuity of ancient Greece to sort of forge its identity in that classical tradition to however he understood it, to give it a, a heritage and all that. And Dante, we see the Inferno is very much, it's a descent into the underworld. And there's a, there's a scene, I think it's in book four or six of the Enid, where, you know, Enos defends uh, descends into into the underworld and he interviews these souls of the underworld so it's clear that Dante is hearkening right back to this ancient tradition where he starts in the underworld and then he rises he, this is within the new tradition of Christianity so bridging the ancient world with the new modern Christian world which would become the you know world of the Renaissance and I mean, there's tons of things that could be said about the Inferno. There's all sorts of very compelling stories, him meeting different sinners. He meets his own masters too, his mentors. He meets uh, Brunetto Latini, who was uh, an ambassador to uh, Byzantium and to the court of Alfonso the Wise. And he brought back the uh, Tesoro, which was an encyclopedic work of all basically knowledge that had been available at that time. He meets his other mentor, Guido Cavalcante, uh, also in hell, in different parts of hell for different sexual deviations. <laughs> and uh, you meet all sorts of people, Paolo and Francesca, which is a very, it's a very famous story where Francesca is married to a nobleman and she starts to become very interested in a young man and they start reading the Lancelot love tales together. And each time they would read a bit more. And finally, you know, I think in the, you know, they're reading a part where the, the characters in the book kiss uh, and they, you know, they decide to get together. And then the Duke comes in, you know, catches them and murders them both. And, you know, so they're in hell or, you know, how do you call it, uh, for, for cheating, for, you know, being untrue to their marriage. And I read something interesting about what's really the moral of the story, because in a sense, it's like this young lady was married to this Duke, not by choice. And she, you know, fools around with this other guy. But there was this commentary that was saying that the problem with Paolo and Francesca, because Dante faints when he, he hears this story and he's very, they're sinners, but he's very compelled by their story. He feels for them. There's a, there's a lot of empathy. Um, and in the article, it says that Dante and uh, Francesca and Paolo were not so much in love with themselves, but with this story of Lancelot, they were in love with the idea of love itself. So it was not love, but it was the idea of love, that they were 
taken by, and this is what seduced them. And so there's all these different instances of different kinds of sin. And, you know, situating this today, why should people read the comedy today? You know, oh, it's a Christian religious, uh, you know, work. But the way Dante develops the idea of sin, which is the way that then the population would read this in the vulgar tongue and uh, be challenged is it's sin is not, it's cast from a positive light. Sin is the thing that blinds you from a high vision of our true nature. It blinds us from our innate potentiality as creative human beings. And so all these different sins from rage, from treachery, uh, lust, usury, all these sins against nature, what they really are are impediments to developing that as an individual. And so as Dante goes through hell, he sees a bit of himself in many of these characters and he's challenged to look into himself. And so this is hell and it ends with very interesting. What is Satan? Satan is, you know, the heads of Brutus and Cassius. Treacherers. Treachery is the worst sin. And it's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's very compelling. And so then he makes his way to purgatory. Hell was a descent. Purgatory is an ascent. It's a very hard ascent. It's somebody who is conscious of their sins, but is, is willing to uh, make amends and to cleanse themselves of these things that cause them to deviate. To, to inhibit their own creative potentials. Whereas the sinners in hell are just blind. They're completely blind and have no way of redemption. And as he goes higher up purgatory, interestingly, the climb becomes easier. As, the, as, the, as he continues up the slope, the climb becomes easier and easier and easier. And he eventually has to make a leap of faith across a wall of fire and this whole time he's guided by Virgil, right, who is his, his poet guide, uh, which gives you a sense of, you know, where Dante's coming from, this ancient world, this ancient tradition that he sees himself in. But Virgil has to leave him behind. He can't cross past the wall of fire. He's now going to meet Beatrice, who I probably didn't say enough about. Sorry about that. But yeah, the woman who's been calling him from the start, uh, this woman that he talks about in all his poems, who in the, the comedy has sent Virgil to guide him through the inferno and purgatory to make his way up to paradise. So that's the ultimate question comes for us even today. What is the nature of paradise? I mean, this was touched on in the last class, which is what's interesting. What is this paradise that we're going to? What is the nature of paradise? And of course, if we're not hyper literal minded people that just freak out as soon as we hear some sort of like religious notion and automatically assume we know what we're talking about we can think okay well what is this idea of paradise that dante is developing there's a religious motif but what is the higher idea the poetic idea that dante is getting across so if my screen will move, there we go. We're going to see you know, paradise. So this is another etching by Gustave Dali. So what is paradise like? Let's, let's get some, somebody who hasn't read the comedy. I mean, we, we had a discussion of paradise before. What are we to expect in Dante's paradise? Can I just hear some ideas of paradise from people? Just to situate this, right answer, wrong answer. If you have the answer, you know. One, one idea that came up a couple of weeks ago after, a, I think it was a size class, was an eternal banquet. <laughs> okay. 
I'm lactose intolerant, so there better not be. <laughs> Paradise for everybody, right? Okay. I think from uh, our religious training within, say, the Christian framework, we look at all things like paradise as something beyond our present life. So, okay, there's some kind of judgment that occurs when we die, as opposed to what if we make it all present? So this is a present reality to the, the spiritual being we are. We're experiencing paradise right now over experiencing hell right now because of the choices we're making and the life we're living and and perhaps the extent to which we are pursuing Dante's love. Right. And I mean, it's not an easy thing to depict. Like, how do we capture the essence of paradise or, you know, even what is it? So... <clears throat> Well, from, from ancient Iran, it means, it simply means a, a, a closed garden. Okay. Natul Firdaus, uh, Firdaus uh, which is a, a Persian, Persian word for paradise, is also incorporated in the Quran, borrowed from, from Farsi, from Persian. Shana. Arabic. And uh, it, it is pretty much the concept of a garden and uh, it's very physical. Uh, but uh, there are indications of uh, of a, uh, a certain event after people start living in the paradise, where uh, which is similar to the Christian uh, heaven, or it's like beatification, uh, vision of God, and you are forever, uh, mesmerized by it or something. So that's what I see in this image as well. Uh, it's more a Christian uh, idea of heaven or paradise mm -hmm. okay. well, I, have, I have this is uh, Jerry's wife <laughs> I've oh, been sitting Jerry's in wife. Like, Jerry's wife. I have a name too valid I was just thinking of um, I was thinking of the idea of the common good that all of humanity would work together consciously for the common good of all people. Right. Okay, without ulterior motives. Right. Well, so that's kind of my idea. <laughs> well, I like that. And it's, but it's interesting because if you think about it, like, okay, we're also, we're also good. And like, yeah, paradise is like, you know, for the good of others. And you know what I mean? But it's interesting that, okay, why can't it, if we're just, let's say we're just, an average person, uh, sorry, I, don't, I, I can't find another word. I have to be careful with words these days. But, you know, why is it not just like turkey and, and beer and like we're in paradise, like we did our part and now we just get to enjoy and, and relax. And paradise is whatever that thing we think is to be aspired to, you know, having a cold one in the sun and why can't that be paradise? Well, that's a very superficial paradise, I think, okay? Right. I think I think it's this idea that um, it's when you, as I explain it to my third graders all the time, I said, look, okay, if you help somebody, it makes you happy as well. Very true. Yeah, true. And, yeah, that, that's where, that sort of dovetails what George uh, was just talking about, too, regarding the paradise here on, you know, by doing yeah. good and the, the living in paradise, rather than it being a reward uh, for so, some. So we somehow can get this, we can somehow get this, um, this, the, it's not a belief. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually true, right? Um, yeah. If we can get this so interwoven into the society that it is, a, that it would be just a, a normal thing that you constantly strive to do good to others so in turn it will make again it'll make you happy also it's yeah it's very hard to describe what i mean <laughs> let's let's read some dante let's find out what he says just so, quick uh quant 
you're allowed to say your uh, your thought online too. Uh, you don't have to just write it because it usually doesn't. Yeah, I, I can't read your writing. I mean, I I'm not uh, I'm not tech savvy. I don't know where to find it. You can speak if you'd like. Okay, so I just wrote that it's a space of creativity where we can be truly be human and created on Earth. Okay. I mean, these are serious questions, right? Do we want to create a paradise on Earth? How, we're, in, we're kind of like in hell, it seems, these days. Uh, things seem pretty uh, getting out of control. So, I, you know, these are real political questions. And I think that's how Dante saw it. They're not just abstract. So, Canto 2. I think it's, not, it's a decent place to just get a, a taste of what he has to say. All you who in your wish to hear my words have followed thus far in your little boat behind my ship that singing sails these waters. Go back now while you still can, while you still can see your shores. Do not attempt the deep. It well could be that losing me, you would be lost yourself. I set my course for waters never traveled. Minerva fills my sails, Apollo steers, and all nine muses point the bears to me. Those few of you who from your youth have raised your eager mouths in search of angels' bread, and which man feeds here, always hungering. You may indeed allow your boat to sail the high seas in the furrow of my wake, ahead of parted waters that flow back. Those heroes who once crossed the deep to Cholketh, the culture, and saw it there, Jason put behind a plow, were not amazed as much as you will be. By that innate and never-ending thirst for God's own realm, we sped up just as fast as human eyes can rise to meet the skies. My gaze on Beatrice, hers on heaven, in less time than an arrow strikes the mark, flies through the air, loose from its catch. I found myself in some place where a wondrous thing absorbed all of my mind, and then my lady, from whom I could not keep my thirst to know, turned toward me, as joyful as her beauty. Direct your mind in gratitude, she said, to God, who raised us up to his first star. We seem to be enveloped in a cloud as brilliant, hard, and polished as a diamond struck by a ray of sunlight. That eternal celestial pearl took us into itself, receiving us as water takes in light, its indivisibility intact. If I was body, on earth we cannot think in terms of solid form within a solid, as we must hear, since body enters body, then so much more should longing burn in us to see that being in whom we can behold the union of God's nature with our own. Once there, we shall behold what we hold true through faith, not proven but self-evident, a primal truth, incontrovertible. I said, my lady, all my adoration, all my humility is gratitude to him who raised me from the mortal world. But tell me what the dark spots are, which seen from earth along the surface of this body lead men to make up stories about Cain. He's talking about the spots on the moon. Mm. She smiled a little. Then she answered me, that human judgment that human judgment must reach false conclusions when no key is provided by our senses, this surely should be no surprise to you. Since as you know, even when the senses guide, reason's wingspan sometimes can be short. But tell me what you think the cause might be. And I, the difference we see from earth, I think, are caused by different densities. She said then, I'm certain you shall see that your beliefs are deeply steeped in error. Now listen to my counter arguments. Heaven's eighth sphere is lit by many lamps, all of which shine with great diversity, both in their quality and quantity. If rare and dense alone produce all this, one single virtue would be in them all in more or less or equal distribution. But these show different qualities, the fruits of diverse active principles of which your reasoning would demolish all but one. Moreover, if the cause of those dark marks were density alone, this planet's substance would either be in certain parts translucent or else there would be a simple 
alternation of dense and rare, like lean and fat and neat, or in a book as pages alternate. Yet if the first were true, the moon could not fully block out the sun. In an eclipse, some light would shine through the transparencies, but it does not. So let us examine the second case. And if I prove it wrong, then your opinion will be falsified. Well then, if this rare matter does not spread all the way through, this means there is a point at which some denser matter blocks its way. And it would be from there that the sun's rays would be bent back as color is reflected back from a glass concealing lead behind it. The power and motion of the sacred spheres must by the blessed movers be inspired just as the hammer's art is by the smith. That heaven whose beauty shines with countless lamps from the deep mind that turns, its, turns it, takes its stamp, and of that image makes itself the seal. And as the soul within your living dust diffuses through your body's different parts, adapted to its various faculties, just so does this intelligence unfold its bounty, which the stars have multiplied while turning ever in its unity. Different virtues mingle differently with each rich stellar body that they quicken, even as the soul within you blends with you. True to the glad nature from which it flows, this blended virtue shines throughout that body as happiness shines forth through living eye. And from this virtue, not from dense and rare, derive those differences of light we see. This is the formal principle that gives according to its virtue, dark and light. Hmm. That was her answer. <laughs> that was, so that's very interesting, right? I mean, we could probably read that more than once over just to break it down, but this is paradise. I mean, I, I, I almost feel like I would probably, a lot of people would be disappointed. I mean, this is paradise. I, I'm like, have tests and exams now and I have, <laughs> you know, I'm getting graded. Are you doing this? Um, yeah, that's not, that's not what I was hoping for, you know, but so they're in a dialogue about the nature of the universe and and each translation is a bit different and they're all, they're not always the easiest uh, to follow. But the idea is Dante first gives a reason for dense and rare. And she proposes an experiment to say that it can't just be that because if there were an eclipse, it doesn't shine through at all. So if it was just about density and rarity, light would shine a bit through at some points and less, less or more at different points, but it wouldn't be stopped all the way. But regardless of that, kind of argument, the point being made is a higher kind of causality, right? Why things are the way they are and not otherwise, and how nature distributes its virtue, its potential in different things in different degrees. And I mean, you know, simply put, if we look at, you know, the power for change in inanimate matter or rock versus biological matter, leaves and trees and nature, the ability to create oxygen, atmospheres, uh, to animals, which are guided with instinct, but still have the ability to, you know, react and move and, and do different things. And then you have human beings, which have a higher power of mentation, which can actually discover the principles that organize the universe and actually intervene and change the universe change the course of history. So nature expresses itself in different powers, in different forms. That's the kind of idea she's actually putting forward. So in paradise, you know, it's not really a test of, you know, is it A, B, C, or D, or, you know, how does, you know, the lion hunt, or how does the ocean even, you know, where does water come from? It's a, it's a, question of higher causes, of, of final causes, of reason for that underlies the universe. And so throughout, this sets the tone. This is Canto too. This sets the pacing for the whole of paradise, where Dante continuously asks questions and rises to higher and higher levels of understanding about the nature of paradise, of, of the nature of the universe and ultimately of its 
creator, the principle that drives it all, which he refers to the final line is the love that moves the sun and all the other stars. That's how he puts it. That's it closes on. Yeah. At this point, my power failed high fantasy, but like a wheel in perfect balance turning, I felt my will and my desire impelled by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. So it's a whole process of discovery. And it's very humbling. It's very different than what we might expect. And you can imagine the population of Italy, right, hearing in their vulgar, in, in their own vernacular, all these questions about the nature of the universe, the nature of man. What does this mean about human beings if the whole universe is organized according to these principles, which we can investigate, you know, what should we do? And this is really the, this is what laid the groundwork for humanism, for the Renaissance, where the idea was the, that every individual is made in the image of a creator, which can be thought of before anybody freaks out in a scientific way that each mind reflects, is a reflection of that creative principle that organizes the whole universe, that there's a likeness, that we, through the investigation of our own minds, are really investigating the universe and can know it and become ever closer to the creator through this investigation, you know? Well, you know, uh, Einstein had uh, commented once that when, what was his motive for science for all of his work and, and uh, efforts? And he said, it's to come to know the mind of God and nothing less. And right. that's, you know, a guy who generated a lot of very potent hypotheses throughout the course of his life. But that knowing that that was his motive and you have similar things being said from people like Max Planck as well, who uh, was very specific that his drive was to come to know the composer she saw as being a creative uh, musician that God was had a musical quality that he wanted to come to know when he uh, dis made all of his discoveries throughout his life. Uh, that's interesting. Right. And so this lays out that, you know, if you think about what, it's funny because people talk about Dante does like Aristotle or he thinks, but he doesn't have access to the Greeks or Plato directly or any of these things. Uh, but his conception is deeply platonic. Dante's thinking, his whole approach is platonic. It really lays the groundwork for the kind of thinking that will inspire all these Renaissance geniuses who just have this idea that the human mind is able to investigate the nature of the universe and how that happens. So that's, this is the comedy. This is, it can end well, it ends well. So yeah, that's, I, I leave it at that. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, any Perfect. thoughts or questions or? I'm gonna so, close my PowerPoint. Question is, is Dante at the cutting edge of the development of humanism or what Matt calls the Renaissance in that there's a letting go of finding truth through authority and figures from the past and an opening up to discovering the truth um, when we seek ourselves and when we discover those principles and when as uh, to get into science like uh, Matt suggested and as we translate principles into language that can be tested and then as we test them so I believe if, if this is correct this is a the fundamental shift of western culture is happening at this very point where authority 
is left behind, and that's, I guess, Prometheus principle. You leave behind that whole way of expressing and finding truth from before and launch into this adventure of, of discovering truth yourself, discovering the creator yourself, discovering the principles. A lot of assumptions built in here because you have to assume that the universe is built on principles and laws that can be discovered. So this, but this shift is maybe different than in other cultures. Like China didn't develop science and technology. That was, it was there, but why did the West push ahead into science and technology? And I'm just wondering, are we looking at the turning point right here? Yeah, in many ways, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much, it's just the advanced the conception of the human individual as there, you know, as there is, right? This idea between the, uh, the relationship between the mind of the creator, the principle organizing the universe and our ability to uh, investigate it. Uh, I just say that what I was looking at, because during Dante's time, he didn't have access to the Greek texts or to Plato. Uh, the Aristotle was everywhere though. Uh, that's what dominated. And uh, uh, Dante did like Aristotle. He, he called him the philosopher. And, uh, you know, he's, he used Aristotle's language, but in his essays and stuff, it, it very, it reads very much, it's very Aristotelian, it's very logic, it's because of these three points, now I'm going to explain these three points, and da, 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 da. but his thinking is deeply platonic, and I, based on what I could see, much of it comes from Augustine and uh, Boethius. Uh, one work I would recommend is to everyone is The Consolation of Philosophy by uh, Boethius. That's what I was going to read. I had some in my PowerPoints, but uh, Boethius read Greek. He read Plato and the ideas of the good, of the Republic, all that are in Boethius and the poetry and prose. And Dante read that. And you, Boethius is one of the 12 uh, divine lights in paradise. So yeah, Platonic thought did very much shape Dante's approach. If you look at Boethius and what Dante's doing, it certainly wasn't Aristotle, uh, but Dante didn't have direct access to the Greeks. So it, I think it came through Plato's and uh, through Augustine and Boethius's approach. And yeah, the humanist studies is the re rediscovery of the ancients, right? That's one of the big things, a rediscovery of the classical idea but in the Renaissance with this new conception of man in the image of the creator, that each individual uh, is sacred and has the ability to investigate uh, the universe, to discover the principles organizing the universe through their minds. And thus be free of the ancients and free of the authority of the ancients to learn and explore. Yeah, taking the best traditions of the past though, right? The, you know, the Greek language and, and Greek philosophy and just, it, it's a, I mean, it's a synthesis of, it's, it's a new, it's a qualitative shift through the Christian Renaissance. But uh, yeah, you can definitely see Plato's approach in, 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 Dante's, uh, in Dante's method. If we yeah, look at Christian image of the sorry, just to say at the end of the comedy, he uh, when he looks into the sun, right, the light that he sees an image of his own face. He says, <laughs> "The highest vision at the highest vision of paradise, when he looks into the blinding sun, yeah, he sees an image of himself." So that's that's really the idea of the Trinity. Right, of you know, man is in the image mediated through Christ, but we're each in that image through our flesh, but we have access to uh, this higher, uh, we are also a reflection of this higher uh, spiritual principle. But is poetic imagery is breaking free from a strictly theological language cast as he brings in nature and love and so on it, it seems i don't know if he intends this but it seems to be breaking free freeing up the mind of the reader to 
to look at the universe and 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 uh, see God as as being expressed through the sun and the moon and the stars and through nature and so on. So he's inviting us to look. Yeah, yeah. I I mean that's why I like the idea. What universe are we in? That's really what it comes down to, and an honest investigation of that. Mm-hmm. And now we are currently in somewhat of a, a, you know, inferno. And we have to get back to that same question. It doesn't change. You know, morality doesn't really change. If we want to know if we're right, if our opinions are right, let's see what the universe has to say. You know, just to briefly say, postmodernism rejects the idea that there is a truth that you can discover. There is a truth that's absolute. You can, it seems like this is all discarded as we move to postmodernism, and this is what the uh, our modern uh, uh, generation on the streets has been taught in their studies at university is is it's basically a discarding of the kind of way to see truth that you're talking about here today with Dante. Right. I've I've heard I've gone. I think it's an interesting reaction though because I've asked these questions like that pose the kind of paradoxes Dante's posing. And I've had the answer, the universe doesn't care what we think. The universe doesn't care about us. The universe is indifferent, right? So never mind, you know, whatever. But so, but it's an interesting thing. Is the universe good? Is it bad? A lot of people say it's bad in the sense, look at all the bad things that do happen. How could you say the universe is a good place? It's, you know, it's filled with, suffering and slavery and da, da, da. the idea that the universe is good or that the creator of that universe is good is not obvious to the senses right it's not an obvious answer or an obvious question or that it's not good or bad it's just indifferent so here Dante's saying that it's good right there's a the, the, you know he talks about the love that moves the sun and all the other stars yeah what does that mean though that the universe is good? Does it respond to, you know, I like to think empires always destroy themselves. You know, they, they, they don't, these institutions can't last because they're ultimately going against the order of the universe. Every time I'm on Matthew's um, um, seminar so far, I find myself defending postmodernism somewhat. And I'll, I'll do so again, but, but not because I disagree with George or, or, or you at all, Dave, but just because um, precisely because the universe is good, then reactions come in a particular way that give us directions for where um, the, the one is again. And the precise way that feminism, et cetera, um, emotionally reacts to a certain kind of stance on principle, um, it's very, very consistent, even though what they say is very inconsistent. Um, and uh, I think this is a, a way of bringing us back to in an embodiment that Aristotle versus Plato, I would say, especially is, is a bit of a problem, this kind of discursive rationality. Um, so that's why Jordan Peterson was, was so popular because he was always, always about wholesome instantiation of, of principle, of, 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 of living it in, in, in heart, mind and body. And, and um, that is, has been an issue, like a kind of hypocrisy that arises in the West, all these false dualisms. Um, so if I could bring this back then to what I mentioned before about Al-Ghazali, I, I think it's, it's a really, really important crux of things because what happens in, in the Islamic world is essentially um, Ib- Ibn Rushd and the, and the philosopher that they called them, the, the ones that really loved Aristotle and were starting to um, really uh, captivate the, 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 the Muslim um, elite. Um, they were basically shut down completely by the brilliance of Al-Ghazali. Um, who, number one, he wrote a book explaining the, the, the principles of, of Ibn Rushd and, and, and of people like them. And then he just showed them how they're completely inconsistent with principle, like they contradict themselves. And then from then on, the, the Muslim world just basically didn't follow that line and the scholastics did. So in, in answer to George's question as to why the West ended up pursuing science as opposed to being, and, and, and secularization essentially, um, and, and why, um, uh, say, Islam didn't, there's d- different reasons for why China didn't. It's, it's because it, in a lot of ways, Al-Ghazali shut it down. And, and there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, maybe he shut it down too harshly. 
Um, but it's interesting to see uh, modern Muslims these days saying, we need a renaissance just like the West so we can be as materially powerful as the West. And we made a wrong turn with Al-Ghazali. Um, I don't agree with that at all, but it's interesting to see that. Just the thought, based on what you're saying about the, the, the different directions that it took. I can't say I understood your first point, though, about postmodernism and, and what you're saying about feminism and the consistencies or not. Maybe elaborate it, on that. Essentially, to, to bring the, um, emotions in, um, back in a different way to, you, you know, if, if um, instantiation of the body in, in, um, in, in wholesome connection with, with principles um, is, is to mean anything. It means that the consistent arising of certain emotions within the population have to be part of the picture. You cannot ignore them and just say because they're irrational that they're disposable. You have to be able to interpret them just like I guess any good marriage um, a husband does for the wife very often um, because the wife will have certain intuitions that the, the man's rationality oh, okay. and, and logical map does, doesn't work very well. But, but the man must do very deep her, hermeticism, uh, not hermet hermeneutics of, of the emotions, essentially. Well, I think the question of poetry helps here um, in many ways. First off, just because on, I wanted to speak to your second point where you said the, you know, the deviation, the divergence between, you know, uh, the West going for science, right, and Islam then not, or however you put it. But the idea, I think, of literal versus non-literal thinking in religion, right, or uh, something that you learn in poetry, which applies to, especially, I mean, if you're talking about the Quran or any religion, is there's always this battle between the orthodoxy, right, the literal interpretation of text, the literal interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, the literal interpretation you know, of laws, versus a more non-literal sense of principle and, you know, how that is expressed in literal terms. Right, so thinking poetry challenges you to think in that higher mode, so it's that you're not just thinking about the literal things before you, but you're thinking about what underlies that. The more orthodox uh, tendencies, and which become you know orthodox religious, you know it's this way, you know, Muhammad didn't have a toothbrush, so we don't need toothbrushes type of thing. Um, that comes from literal thinking. Literal thinking is very, it's like a disease. And so poetry allows people to think. And I mean, if you, but with emotion, right? There's, but there's a thought behind an emotion. So I think the idea like in poetry, right? In Dante's canzone, they're not, there are feelings, but they're not irrational. They're coming from somewhere. And the poem is really an investigation of the nature of that, what underlies that, what causes these paradoxes or, you know, contradictory emotions, you know? That's, as you said initially as well, that the literal is the foundation of the poetic. Term. So to be very careful about disparaging the literal, that's something that's very clear in Islam. Maybe um, the prophet didn't use a toothbrush, but it is very good to follow the prophet, um, even though that's not the only reason. If you only follow it because this is the key, just literally following to get into Jenna, then you're, you're definitely lost. Then you're just lost in the literal and you've lost the poetic. point is you can't but, think But the without the literal, the, the poetic can't work either. You're right. The literal like is the first step. But yes. Yes. if we're just hostage to literal text and interpretations, we see that it means people cannot think. So we're going to be stuck with, should I use a toothbrush or not? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're, it's not there in the literal text. So unless there is some sense of like, sovereign reasoning cars i mean you know where do we get our rules from i i would argue about speaking from the christian development and development of theology and religion and all the denominations of christianity pretty well that we see at the moment that there has been a failure to break out of a fundamental literal approach to the text and even though it could be well argued that Jesus taught an example of breaking free from the past, it was said, but I say unto you, and he teaches some principles for going beyond just text. As I see it, most denominations have gone back to text. Here's some verses and therefore here's our law, here's our ethics and so on. So yeah. I, I, we're living with 
a manifestation of Christianity that has failed in the revolution that we're talking about here, which is to break out of the sort of authority of the text to, to dis discover principles and discover truths and apply those. So uh, somehow we are lagging behind in the uh, revolution that we're talking about right here, a shift of authority. I mean, this is why poetry is a serious deal, that it's not just, you know, about feelings and whatnot. And, you know, we said earlier, uh, you know, the idea that poetry is at the heart of scientific thought. If we're thinking in terms of the investigation of paradox and irony, right, the way poem unfolds, the way we're going to find the idea, it's very much like a scientific investigation. It's just it's more turned inward than it is outward to the external universe but the process is the same. And when you don't have a poetic culture, when people are not able to communicate poetic ideas or they don't have the ability to communicate at the level necessary, which is at a, a poetic level, uh, you know, the debates just degenerate. The dis there is no real possibility for dialogue. And it's all the kind of things we hear today, you know, about this or that. And I'm not even gonna say what that or this is just to say you know you have to say things the right way otherwise there's the literal there's the yeah. literal right yeah it's 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 very tribal in that sense you can't have a dialogue it's only with people that agree with you <laughs> i've had the best dialogue with like postmodern or more modernist uh uh you know orientated thinking like those they make for very interesting dialogues uh, I mean, where you feel like you're, you're challenged to defend your own ideas and you're also willing to have your most fundamental beliefs challenged. And, and that's poetry is the key to being constructive there, isn't it? It really does help. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, that could be a whole class, right? The, the poetry of uh, uh, Arabic poetry and, uh, you know, the, the dialogue of cultures, that poetry should really form a basis for a dialogue of cultures. And I know Helga Sepp LaRouche, the chairwoman of the Schiller Institute, she's often uh, talked about uh, this idea of a dialogue of cultures and let each culture discover the high points, the classical uh, uh, cultures of each different uh, nation. And in so in discovering these high points, we'll, we'll, we learn so much about, uh, it informs our own culture and enriches our, ourselves. And, you know, I think a great example is um, the Islamic Renaissance and the architecture, all the scripts, right? Because the worship of images as such was banned, right? Because there's one creator. And so we, you don't really want to have any one image uh, that people, you know, sort of look to. The creator's everywhere. There's only one. You have calligraphy and calligraphy becomes the basis of, you know, some of the most beautiful architecture. I'm looking there because I have some there. Uh, yeah, and so that 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 uh, limitation, if you will call it, or it, it bound them to create new ways uh, that didn't exist before in terms of artist, artistic, architectural development. So I mean, we'll learn a lot. We could learn a lot from that. That ver poetic verses everywhere, a poetic culture, poetry is everywhere. Uh, the language is poetic. The Quran is basically a poem. I mean, there's so much, in a sense, Dante did what the Quran did for Islam. He did that in Italian. You know, the Bible doesn't rhyme. It's not a poem as such. The comedy is, and, and the Quran is very much like a poem. Verses, poetic verses. Just to reiterate a little bit, uh, Dante, uh, well, a lot of Dante's success depends on how uh, successfully uh, he utilized the vernacular, right? As compared to the rigidity of Latin uh, scripture. So he's uh, translating uh, uh, the scripture, uh, the stories from the scripture, the, ima the imagination also uh, is also borrowed from Islam and Greeks, but he's doing it uh, in a way that, it, uh, that is appealing to the masses that actually speaks to their hearts. It's in their language, in their tongue. So I think that's, uh, that's also very important where uh, uh, 
although you 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 have a, you can create a culture which is able to uh, uh, appreciate poetry and take things uh, uh, written uh, or uh, oral traditions even uh, more figuratively appreciate the, the the spirit of what is being said instead of just a letter but also there is a need to improve the literary content improve the language as well because uh, what happens after Dante why it's a critical point in European history is that uh, you have the uh, the creation of a new culture which is uh, springing out of Dante's uh, literary work that language is taking its root uh, root from uh, Dante's uh, comedy mm. yeah I was thinking about um, that, that image that you showed at the beginning of your presentation of Dante, that painting, which has the, the, uh, the Brunelleschi dome behind him to his left. Mm -hmm. And that sort of dovetails what Assad was saying. And Cynthia gave uh, a really nice lecture on this, uh, which is on the, on the website, on uh, Brunelleschi's dome. But people often, they, they know that Brunelleschi's dome um, sort of like acknowledged that this thing is an incredible feat. Uh, to this day, there's no bigger uh, masonry dome that's ever been created. It's not even, it's not been figured out with all of our modern science, not still been figured out how they were able to achieve this. It seems to defy the, 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 the physics that we have, that it was done, but it's done. You can't argue with that. Right. Um, and in, in Cynthia's lecture, she, she goes through how this thing was a multi-generational challenge that was first put out there by Dante Alighieri. To, to get the ball rolling, and he never even came close to seeing it in his lifetime, but it organized all of Florence for many generations to put their, their best minds to work, and a whole engineering artistic movement came out of that process of problem solving. It was a whole society of problem solvers in which Da Vinci, a young Da Vinci, was able to sort of go through, study Brunelleschi's machinery, and develop his own understanding uh, of the universe that he then participated in designing the dome that was put on the, on the, that capped it at the, at the very end. But all this stuff couldn't have happened were it not for Dante Alighieri's initiative to begin with. Yeah, no dialogue would have even been possible. Yeah. Right, and then how do you get, like, without a common language, how do these different engineers and everybody from Milan, from all parts of, of Italy, communicate with each other properly and competently on top of it, right, just on, a, on, a, on that level? Right. It probably wouldn't have happened were it not for his literary unifying uh, effect on the language. Yeah, no, I mean, Da Vinci didn't even, uh, he wasn't very literate. From what I know, he was, uh, I mean, he learned, he wasn't good at writing for, uh, he wasn't, uh, he didn't know Latin, from what I understand. He wasn't uh, an educated guy, quote unquote, but it was his method of investigation that really, and his idea, right, of, of the universe, right, his approach that allowed him to make breakthroughs in every field. It was free. It was, Sounds the like it was wasn't derived from books or, or other authorities. It was, it was all internally generated authority but, that he had won for himself by honest investigation. Yeah, but the comedy is something he could know, you know, whether by text or, you know, it was in his, it was in, Tuscan dialect, uh, hmm. actually, I mean, the Tuscan was close to, so he was able to understand it. But Da Vinci wrote pro prolifically, right? There's no, I know, but he wasn't, I know that he wasn't considered like a man of letters, like the guy really yeah. had to teach He wasn't him. respected in that sense. Yeah. And uh, he was by no means, uh, you know. He didn't just write, he, he's, he's, he's drawing a lot of He's inventing creatively through his imagination. So somehow he has a portal to heavenly wisdom that he's downloading through his imagination and he continues to draw and draw and draw uh, daily in his notebooks. And by keeping that flow going, it seems like he stays in touch with his flow of creativity and he's just creating all kinds of ideas all the time. That's pretty amazing. A modern, or at least a, a, more, a humanist Tesla, you might say. Not, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. I just wanted to add one other thing. You know, where you see the picture of uh, Dante in the Inferno and he's being led around by Virgil. Mm. The interesting thing is Virgil is not allowed to enter paradise. So I think Dante is trying to say that not just Virgil, but the Latin language was incapable of describing paradise. And that gets into a lot of stuff. I mean, Latin basically was a bureaucratic language. That's how the Roman Empire functioned over all of these countries they conquered and people. So it was the language of the army and the bureaucrats. And while Virgil and certain people tried to, you know, write poetry with it, you know, Virgil's Aeneid, it, it lacked a certain thing, a certain inner love of mankind, whatever you want to say, that it couldn't describe paradise. And it forced Dante to realize the only way he could write this thing was he'd have to invent Italian because mm. he couldn't do it writing it in Latin. It lacked the ability to describe certain ideas. Mm. So it's not that he rejected all of the old writings and everything. He just recognized that Latin and the Roman Empire particularly, which is what Latin was, was incapable of what he wanted to do. And that's why he wrote just the common dialect, the vulgar Italian. Well, mm -hmm. it became Italian because of him. There was no Italian. He invented it through the Commedia. But oh, wow. it's, that's, there's a famous uh, painting by Rembrandt. <clears throat> Some people call it Aristotle viewing the bust of Homer. Yeah. Some people call it uh, Virgil contemplating the bust of Homer, and he's there's a you know the statue, the head of Homer. Virgil has his hand on his head, trying to somehow miraculously get Homer's ideas into him through touching it, but he can't. And that really goes into the problem with Virgil, that he he can't express these type of concepts, which the ancient Greeks could, but. Dante didn't have access to it, but he knew there was something that could, that wasn't Latin. Latin, he knew, wouldn't do it. But I just wanted to add that to uh, throw something in there. Interesting. Do people realize that the Roman Catholic Church used Latin in services up until the 1960s? So... If you were attending a Roman Catholic church, um, unless you knew Latin, you didn't understand the content of the service until after Vatican II. Uh, this, for the Protestants, that changed with Luther. All of a sudden, again, the Bible is written in the, the language, the vulgar language or the language of the people for the first time. Say Luther translates the right. Bible into German. And, I'll, and you also have the printing press. So now you have the Bible available in the language of the people that they can read and people start learning to read. And, and this is an, another revolution, but Latin is not just the Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic Church as well. What, what was being said, what was being thought, and what was theology and what was in the Bible was basically exclusive. Catholics didn't know. Yeah. And until they were allowed to start working in the language of the people, and that's after Vatican II. So a very, very recent shift within the within the Christian Church and certainly the Catholic Church. Yeah, that definitely uh, underscores the impact of the comedy, right? Given all these concepts were now available to the masses in you know, Italian mm. that time. So the fear of punishment must have been itself its own uh, hell and purgatory for the Catholic and everyone caught in this system. Mm. I was thinking a, bit, a little bit about um, this interesting convergence 
between these apparent opposing methods of the oligarchy historically of those within the Roman Catholic matrix who chose to uh, abide by this literalist view of the Bible that, you know, man is only good to the degree that he's, he's walking in the, in the footsteps of, of Adam and Eve before they ate from the tree of knowledge and we're in harmony with nature, you know, and we're good right. peasants that knew how to behave. So you, you definitely have that obvious, obviously very politically useful idea for an empire <laughs> that uh, always tends to uh, appear from time to time, more often than not, uh, in, in the, you know, since the Renaissance especially, um, within the Vatican. Not all the time, though. There, there's definitely the the Dante uh, St. Augustine influence that's fought back against it. So we don't want to throw it all, throw out the baby with the bathwater because there is a fight within within the church. But more often than not, that's been the case. But then in the case of, I said convergence at the beginning, this opposing um, enlightenment uh, faction of the oligarchy that said, well, can't beat them, join them. If we can't stop the Renaissance process from, from happening, like people are not able to just like, you know, the, no matter how many people no matter how, how many inquisitions you create, it seems like people still are, are inspired and they're still asking questions and, and progressing in the image and footsteps of Dante and Da Vinci. Uh, so let's, let's just at the very least say we like it and try to covert it, uh, co-opt co it by extracting the part that gives it value that man has made in the image of God. And we'll call this humanism. We'll, 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 we'll say it's just radical empiricism, you know, that, that, People like Descartes or Newton or Galileo tended to be the 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 new gods of that new anti you know quite weird thing called the Enlightenment. So that became something that definitely uh, expressed itself in the in the Protestant sort of matrix of the British Empire. Um, you know, so so that you 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 had the seeming polarization, but they're they're both both movements, whether it's the this this Roman Catholic perversion that, or or this uh, Enlightenment perversion. Neither one, both of them reject the idea that mankind is made in the image of a living, loving Creator. That's not there in either one, and they tended to uh, like in the case of Quebec. I was just doing a little bit of work to prepare for my 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 lecture this coming week, and you you definitely had after Quebec, which was very much governed by the, the Roman Catholic. Uh, approach of just keeping the peasants ignorant, you know, and only the priests were allowed to, to read the Bible. No, everybody else, the idea of representative government was not even a, an issue for, in the minds of most of the peasants in Quebec. Um, but when the British Empire took over, they, they worked together. So you had the, the British aristocracy um, and it's, it's sort of Protestant uh, matrix co working and, and working together very closely throughout most of Canada's history, even with the, this dark age version of the church in the Catholic world to just keep the, pe keep the peasants in their place as human talking cows. But they, they ended up demonstrating that they're both committed to the same thing. It, it was a fake debate. It was a fake fight between the two. Well, the, the, the fake fight, the false dualism is a repeated theme, basically. What we're saying, it happens over and over again. And that can't be the nature of where things really are. That must mean that the root of the divergence is further, further back that we have to examine unless we just want to do Renaissance Dark Age forever and ever. Yeah, it goes deeper. That's right. Yeah. We lost Dave. But Dante's still there. <laughs> I'm just hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you burned your snack. <laughs> so, Matt, are are you saying that the English undermined the Enlightenment with such concepts as Descartes and made it? I'm listening. I'll be back. Sh shifted the shifted the concept from man made in the image of God to man is an totally sort of independent center. So I think therefore I am is separated from the sense that I'm I'm part of the divine order, divinely made and, and made to connect with the divine. Is, is that's the undermining? Well yeah I think Dave could probably say say some things about this. Uh, but yeah for my my uh, limited 
uh, research and knowledge, it, it seems to be that there was a a mythology created that the Renaissance that the Renaissance gave birth to the Enlightenment that it was just a natural organic flow, right? Um, but if you actually take a, a politically, you know, not ignorant v analysis of history, you start seeing from the standpoint that there are governing political agendas, right, with with key players, perf you know, performing at different at different times certain deeds, which is what we I think we're all, we've all made that discovery that that's the only useful way of anal analyzing uh, either current events or the past. Um, yeah, that, that, that becomes a mythology that there was a, an agenda with a lot of effort put in to artificially derail um, what the Renaissance process by introducing, by repackaging some of the, uh, the best ideas of the Renaissance, Kepler's idea, discoveries of, of his three laws, things like that. Um, repackaging them in the form of their keeping their mathematical outward expression their shell but extracting the essence the substance that gave birth to those three laws that Kepler made which then we were told yeah Isaac Newton had an apple fall on his head and pop out the infinitesimal calculus and gravity which are, are all mathematically derivable from Leibniz and Kepler, who were actual Renaissance thinkers, who, whose discoveries like Da Vinci Matt, or, or Newton wrote a complicated explanation for how he came up with it, but it got burnt when his house got burned down by oh, his dear. dog. His right. dog started a fire, <laughs> and he lost all the work. So yeah, it's yeah. Not fair. <laughs> Blame Newton, okay? <laughs> that is the that is the official that is the official story, by the way, why we don't have any of Newton's actual research. <laughs> it's because Newton's dog burnt down his house. <laughs> it got lost. Um, but yeah, that that the enlightenment, as far as I can see, has been a an, an, a total subversion. D Dave Dave cited at the very beginning of his class uh, a little extract from a, an essay by Lyndon LaRouche called uh, "How Hobbes's Mathematics Perverted um, the Renaissance" or something. Um, I'm going to make that available to everybody on, on the, in, dis, in the description to Dave's lecture, and that essay is really useful. LaRouche did some very good research on this, and I, I really couldn't recommend reading that uh, more than anything else on this particular topic. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, well, I was going to hope for Dave to uh, maybe say a couple of closing remarks. Oh, there he is. Okay. Hey, Dave. I'm never far. I'm just... Of course. You, you used a lot of energy. You have to replenish, I understand. <laughs> so why don't you uh, say a couple of words to wrap it up, and uh, yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll go on with our week and prepare for the next what, uh, lecture. What's the next cycle? The next cycle um, will be on the uh, a Harmony of Interests is the, the title, and it's going to be Investigations on the, American, the Universality of the American System. So we want to just sort of uh, disprove the popular notion that America – is some, uh, you know, what, what's popularly thought of when you think of America as, you know, empire, uh, uh, a revolution of people who didn't want to pay their taxes uh, in 1776. Very, very superficial ideas, um, none of which are really true uh, when you start getting down to the substance of the matter. Um, so we're, we've got about nine lectures uh, starting this Wednesday on different aspects of uh, what actually happened at, because in reality, what you went through with your Dante class and this discussion um, is vital to get the American revolution. It, it was a continuation. It was a rejection of the enlightenment in many ways and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, an expression of the Renaissance process in the new world um, that required the entire world to work together and cooperate, at least the better, the better people within Russia, within Britain, within France, within Germany, within Spain, within Italy, within India. You had people within um, uh, Hyder Ali in India, who was a, a, a leader uh, of Muslim India um, in 1776, who all were a part of the process that expressed itself in the, the American Revolution. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a class on... Um, the cultural aspect. So, what was the Ben Franklin challenge that we we failed to understand in 1776, and then that we came close to achieving in, in 18 in the during the Civil War with Calixto Lavalle, um, 
And uh, then Anton Shakin will deliver a lecture on uh, taking, uh, sort of encapsulating his discoveries in his upcoming book. Uh, oh, called, not opening? Uh, huh? Is it, wasn't he opening the series? He's going to be opening the, yeah, I'm sort of doing a precursor uh, to it. A prelude. A, pre a prelude, yeah. And he's going to do the official one on Sunday um, on uh, the British. So what were the humanist networks in London that Ben Franklin organized uh, in the 1750s and 60s? Yeah. about which you can't understand the revolution. And a little bit more afterwards, uh, Jerry's gonna give a class touching on some elements of his, his research and his upcoming book. Uh, yeah, we, we've got a, a good schedule that's on the, the website. Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much, much to add. I think uh, we need uh, poetic culture. Mm. And the best way to do that is to rediscover some of the, the greatest poets out there. Dante being among the best of the best of the best. And also just, I think the need to learn languages. I think people should learn, should learn these advanced, beautiful languages uh, and be able to communicate in different beautiful languages that gives you access to new cultures and in a way that you can't, like these are translations. So you're always going to be missing something. Mm. And uh, yeah, I think that's crucial for people to be sensitive to that and to take the opportunity. I mean, the Humboldt education system, it was the early stages is a lot of languages, right? It's a lot of just learning classical languages, learning Greek, learning, you know. Sanskrit. Yeah. This allows you to think and it, to discover new ways of thinking and, and informs our ability to think in the universe, think in terms of what universe we're in, it shapes it. And mm -hmm. the more languages we know and the more we delve into these poetic uh, you know, areas, the more we, we get a sense of nuance and appreciation for the beauty and complexity and our ability to communicate that and compel others to, to seek to do the same. Good words. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Thank what... you, guys. Thank you, I haven't given a presentation in a long time, so you know it's fun. We have to. Thank you. Like riding a bike. You obviously we need have presentations in our in our diet, in our regular <laughs> weekly diet. Absolutely. All right, guys. All right. Bye. Sup, Bye. Have fun, guys. Ciao.